Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ian Kavat. Now, Taiwan is a thriving young democracy, but that wasn't always the case. Today, on 228 Day in Taiwan, or Peace Memorial Day, we examine the nation's dark history and ask what's standing in the way of reconciliation. With me in the studio to discuss this are Lai Yizong, Prospect Foundation President, former Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in Japan Special Assistant, and former Taiwan Think Tank Vice President, and former Cornell University Visiting Researcher. Also, Guo Tonglong, United Daily News Deputy Editor-in-Chief, a former Fulbright Scholar and International Relations Expert, and Albert Cho, Donghai University Political Science Professor and a Taiwan-US Relations Expert. I also speak with Pong Ren Yu, Academia Sinica Associate Research Professor in Ethnology, a former Transitional Justice Board Member and formerly Convener of Taiwan Association of Clinical Psychology Task Force for Political Trauma and Healing. She tells me transitional justice is necessary to build a real uh, democratic system, to defend that system and defend the core value of our democracy. President Lai, Tong Lun and Albert, well, warm welcome to the show today. But first, what is 228 and how did it lead to Taiwan's White Tower era and why are both such a deep scar on Taiwan's history? Let's take a look. This year marks 76th anniversary of the 228 incident, the worst massacre in Taiwan's recent history. As many as 30,000, mostly local Taiwanese, are thought to have been killed over three weeks, including almost an entire generation of Taiwan's elite. Previously, Taiwan had been a colony of Japan for 50 years, but following the defeat of Germany and the Axis powers, Japan was forced to surrender Taiwan. 228 occurred in the second year of the takeover of Taiwan by Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the Republic of China, which later lost the Chinese Civil War and retreated to Taiwan. The massacre was triggered on the 27th of February when government officers beat a woman they accused of selling contraband cigarettes. They then opened fire on the surrounding crowd. On the 28th of February, angry citizens marched on the governor's office and were fired on together with innocent bystanders. Riots spread within days across the entire country. Taiwan's six million people had initially embraced the ROC's Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, as liberators from the Japanese, but endemic corruption brought the country to its knees. The once rich island nation endured high inflation, unemployment, and was on the brink of starvation. These were the underlying conditions of 228. The incident's scars remain today. Now let's go into a bit more detail. Japan surrendered in World War II and Taiwan, which had been under Japanese control, was placed under the temporary control of the Republic of China, or the KMT. 228 happened soon after that. Albert, I mentioned um, in that video the underlying issues of 228, you know, in corruption, starvation, and high inflation. Mm -hmm. Why were these factors there? Right, uh, we can understand the whole background simply from this photo. Uh, this is a photo where we see the Nationalist Army uh, accept the uh, surrender from the Japanese Empire, even though there was a victory for them. But also, on the other hand, uh, these uh, soldiers actually had a, uh, you know, suffer from a defeat from uh, uh, fighting against the communist China. So these soldiers did not view Taiwan as a destination to stay long. Mm -hmm. They just want to come back as soon as possible to uh, you know, uh, take back the uh, mainland again. Mm -hmm. But in that kind of mentality, so they did not really emphasize Taiwan. Some of them did not have a good sense of morality. They still uh, vows and even food uh, from the mm -hmm. uh, already poor Taiwanese people and even send those valuable stuff back to China. That's mm -hmm. number one. And number two is that the, uh, because there was a short, shortage of the food. I mean, that's mm -hmm. after the war, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that, um, you know, this nationalist army did not really treat uh, Taiwanese people well. Maybe some of them do, but the most of the nationalist people, I mean, they just actually, uh, uh, you know, compete against the local people for food and for clean mm -hmm. water and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that caused a lot of uh, uh, complaint and even dissatisfaction among the uh, Taiwanese people. Mm. Right. So 228, although it refers to February 28th, it actually occurred over a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about some of the forces that drove events after that? Okay, um, the uh, the fight uh, between the Taiwanese people and also the mainlanders continues for weeks long, as we can see from this uh, 
uh, photo, the newspaper reports about uh, that was actually on February 27th, 1947, shooting death of a protesters, which led to a February 28th instance. And there was a vendor uh, who uh, was claimed to sell uh, illicit uh, cigarettes, and that was uh, busted by the uh, Monopoly uh, Bureau of the Cigarettes. And there was a uh, bystander was uh, accidentally shot to death, and that caused the whole uprising. The uh, chief executive, Chen Yi, he originally wanted to concess or kind of compromise a bit to this confrontation, but that's unfortunately only in appearance. In fact, he defined the whole protest uh, as a treason, and those protesters as, as rioters. So he actually made a communication with the leadership in China, probably reached out to Chiang Kai-shek uh, regarding what he's supposed to do. Uh, uh, in the end, uh, troops were sent over from China uh, to Taiwan, uh, start to hit, hurt people and even kill many. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a process of, 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 of the whole uh, uh, uprising. How many people died during White Terror m across the whole martial law? Well, I mean, this is very uh, debatable because uh, simply the 228 incident in itself, uh, uh, some experts will estimate at least 5,000 people die, uh, up to uh, 40,000. Mm -hmm. So uh, it varies from a research to, to another research. Uh, in terms of the white terror, uh, we, we, we got a lot of uh, very famous uh, uh, celebrity who uh, was put in jail. For example, the, uh, the, the great writer Li Yao, he was put in, in jail just because of the uh, white terror uh, accusation. And, and intellectuals like him are abound. But anyway, I think we still have a long way to go to discover the whole truth. And we, our job in Taiwan, uh, either as a ruling party or as a opposition party, is to work uh, together to uh, recover the uh, original picture. Thank you, Albert, for explaining this period of large-scale atrocities in Taiwan's past. So now we have the background. Let's talk about whether 228 and the White Terror are events that impact Taiwan today. Uh, Tong Lun, if I could start with you first. Chiang Kai-shek um, is a controversial figure. He's known as one of the founding fathers of Taiwan, uh, but also he played a role um, in 228 and the White Terror, along with his son, Jiang Jingguo. Uh, how should Taiwanese interpret, it, interpret the figure of the father and son? I think uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, is the one that is quite controversial in Taiwan. Um, for the start, he should uh, be responsible for some of the actions during the February 28th incidents. And he had been so much uh, on uh, personal worship these days that uh, I think it's uh, doing a justice we re-examine uh, and try to put down all those Zhongzhen road uh, that is scattered around in Taiwan. And also, uh, they, they should have a thorough understanding and study on history that what kind of role he had played uh, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And also for Zhang Jingguo, I think he's also played a major uh, part during the White Terror since he's the head of all the intelligence at the time. And in order to consolidate uh, KMT rule, uh, he had also committed some of the uh, uh, crimes that has been done uh, in the general public. So although he had been uh, quite uh, successful in starting Taiwan democratization, there should be a balanced assessment both on him and his father as mm. well. So, so veneration of, of the, the Jiangs is, is not something that you uh, you would support? Uh, I, I think we should, if we want to look back on what uh, had become Taiwan right now, we should be uh, treating them with fair and, and uh, equal uh, assessment. That should be based on facts rather than uh, some, some of the uh, fascination, both from um, um, two camps, right? Mm. President Lai, um, you know, because the KMT were perpetrators, uh, the 
you know, these events badly divided Taiwan's society. So there is um, in Taiwan today, Bun Sun Run, Wai Sun Run, which is, you know, local people who were in Taiwan before the KMT arrived. Is Taiwan still divided along those lines? I think that depends on generations because the, uh, the mainlanders and the local Taiwanese, that kind of dichotomy, uh, that was not only because of the February 28th, um, uh, the massacre, but also the uh, institutional uh, set up uh, success, uh, su uh, later on by the KMT where they set foot in Taiwan. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, civil servants entrance exams, uh, there are the quota for the uh, mainland, uh, people from the mainland, uh, according to the origin. And there are also people uh, for the uh, people from Taiwan. But uh, in terms of the uh, uh, proportion, in order to represent the whole China, so that people uh, from the mainland, they have the disproportional representations uh, in the exam. And the uh, local Taiwanese, they have, oh, they have to only to, to compete a small fraction of it. And, not to, and also, uh, in terms of the, uh, um, uh, the people representative, uh, whether that is in the uh, National Assembly or the Legislative Yuan, we also experienced a long period of the uh, similar institutionalizations uh, that favor the uh, main people from the mainland origin. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this uh, took the, uh, people in, uh, the local Taiwanese in uh, very disadvantaged positions. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a combination of those, not just about the February 20th, but also uh, the issue that has been going on since then, mm -hmm. uh, not just about white terror, but also some of institutionalization according to the ethnic uh, origins. That started to uh, make this uh, Benson and Weissen issues uh, become so permanent. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, and after the democratizations, uh, this issue started to seize uh, that kind of the uh, dichotomy and the uh, controversy. Uh, so that you know, we're seeing today, like uh, especially third generation of so mainlanders, many of them identify themselves as Taiwanese as well. Mm. And uh, they are also fully embraced by the local society. So that uh, unless they say they are from the mainland family, otherwise a lot of people just could not tell the differences. Mm. Albert, mm. Um, what, what's your view on this? I mean, for Taiwan, um, as the as, uh, president said, there used to be, you know, this distinction that's very clear, and now, now there isn't. How about in terms of, you know, pro-unification versus right. independence advocates? Okay, I mean, statistically speaking, you, you know, as I run so many uh, experiments and also collect the data on, on this topic, uh, we did find significant difference between mainlanders and so-called Taiwanese in terms of their perspective uh, towards unification or uh, independence. But I'm kind of on the same page with President Lai that uh, I tend not to, especially norm norm normatively speaking, I tend not to use the typology, uh, you know, Mennonite versus uh, Taiwanese. After all, we are all Taiwanese citizens, right? We all have this Taiwanese uh, citizen ID card and we, we have to uh, shoulder the same responsibility from this country. Uh, mm -hmm. If there is a war uh, uh, breaks out in the future, you know, regardless of your uh, origin, you still have to fight for the, for the land, right? So. I tend not to use the, the typology. What, but I do want to remind though is that uh, the social schism, even though uh, it, it gradually vanished because of the generation you know, change, mm. but still uh, when some ambitious uh, politicians or either from the blue side or the green side try to manipulate that, that will you know, uh, very easily to come back on, on, the, on the, you know, from burner. So we should avoid that. Mm. And so, um, Tong Lung, what sort of um, impact do you think all this has, sort of like, you know, maybe starting from 228, White Terror, um, and then the sort of inequities that President has talked about, the sort of, uh, you can call it suppression right. of the local population. Does this have an impact on elections, local elections, national elections today? Uh, I think that um, one of the things uh, starting uh, when Taiwan becomes democratization, um, it's a term called identity politics. I think that is quite crucial in the democratization of Taiwan. Uh, at the time, uh, there's a structural uh, tension between so-called mainlander and Taiwanese. You can call it trace the origin back to the February 28th incident. And that is translated into KMT and DPP or Dang Wai in a sense. Dang Wai is mostly of Taiwanese and um, KMT are mostly mainlanders. And there's a competition going on. So that end up uh, with the Taiwan politics we are finding. Mm -hmm. But with the time passing, uh, I think uh, with younger generation coming up, and we can see that there's crisscrossing. You can see that there's a, 
uh, mainlander uh, second generation or third generation uh, working in Dang Wai uh, as a group. Uh, they are self-conscious of their identity, but they want to promote Taiwan democracy. But on the other hand, you can also see a Taiwanese. They are inside KMT, but they try to reform the KMT in a way. So it's a mix right now. Mm. And, and now uh, we are seeing with third generation and the fourth generation, they care more uh, nothing about those old identity politics anymore. They are more caring about environmental issues. They are caring more about social issues. And uh, I think in the end, they will transcend those uh, identity politics. Mm. President, um, so is it, do you agree that it is a mix? I mean, you, you said yourself that now there isn't so much of a, this identity being a mainlander versus uh, Taiwanese. But would you say, in conclusion, is Taiwanese society not divided then? Is there an even mix? Or are those exceptions that Tong Lun spoke about? You know, broadly speaking, it's still the two camps. I think if uh, Taiwan continue to remain in the authoritarian period, I would say that the identity politics as well as the uh, distinction between mainland and uh, the, uh, the, the local Taiwanese, that will continue to be a very permanent uh, and a very prevalent uh, factor in politics. But I think it is the uh, democratization in the 90s that people started to uh, have the, uh, uh, the opportunity to voice their own views. Mm -hmm. And I think that just for the Taiwanese who talks about the uh, suppression and uh, the, um, the in inhuman treatment and indignity about what they've been uh, receiving from the KMT side. Mm -hmm. But also it gave the, some of the, the KMT or the uh, mainlanders uh, their perspective about how they've been treated within the KMT as well as that, uh, uh, like uh, some of them, they argue that uh, uh, they, came in Ta they came to Taiwan after 1949, uh, but the uh, February 20th massacre happened in 19, uh, 1947. So the majority of them, they are not responsible uh, for those uh, incidents. And apparently that uh, holds its own truth. And uh, there are also the issue that the white people, they are so much uh, value to the, um, uh, for example, the Republic of China, and uh, how they regard China in Taiwan is to many an uh, older generation that represent a symbol of suppressions. Uh, and uh, when we do not have the opportunity to engage with each other and uh, talk about why, how they feel about those, then it will be difficult like for local Taiwanese to understand why the ROC is a symbol that means so much uh, for the mainlanders in Taiwan. Uh, and I think that democratization itself is a very important factor uh, to help us to really try to see through, especially uh, try to put ourselves on the other people's uh, shoes mm. to understand those issues. Mm. So you're saying that uh, democracy has allowed that dialogue to happen to try to work out some of those issues and those talk about those inequalities. I think that's yeah. true. And mm. of course, the, the whole process is not always very peaceful and calm. Mm. And, uh, and uh, the identity politics has, has been manipulated and continue to be affected today. But at least uh, this has uh, not become an atmosphere of suppression that we witnessed like 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Coming up, how does Taiwan come to terms with this era of past atrocities? The process is facing stumbling blocks, according to a former member of the Transitional Justice Commission. And I think um, in Taiwan, due to different political reasons, uh, for example, uh, I think the main uh, crisis that we, we are facing is that uh, the, the county uh, still um, is still quite influential in our political scene. But first, though the 228 incident was 76 years ago today, to the victims' families, the pain remains. Taiwan Plus reporter Bing Wang speaks to Pan Xingxing, whose father was executed in 1947. 80-year-old Pan Xingxing honors his late father with a prayer. It's a ritual he performs every time he opens this box. Inside are the clothes his father, Pan Muzi, was wearing when he was executed. The holes in the ragged shirt are still visible. Pan Xingxing was just five years old when his father was killed. He wasn't at the scene himself, but two of his older brothers were, and they told him every detail. 
我的三哥啊，去就去抱着他，哦，去抱着他，啊，因为那个整个脸都已经变形了，那个下巴有掉下来，我哥哥把他推上去，然后眼睛给他，把他让他闭起来。In what's become known as the Tutuay Incident, the ruling Kuomintang, or KMT, brutally suppressed anti-government uprisings across Taiwan, killing tens of thousands of people in just a few weeks. Pan Muzi was a respected doctor in the southwestern city of Jiayi. A philanthropist, Pan didn't charge much for poor patients. He even treated soldiers free of charge. I, 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 啊，对对，这些所谓中国来的这些占领军，那他都一视同仁，他为他们做这些事情，结果他们把怕我爸爸抓去枪决掉。The ruling KMT suspected Pan of anti-government sentiments. They jailed and tortured him for three weeks, then shot him in front of the local train station. While in jail, he wrote letters to his wife on whatever material he could find. His last message to her, written on the inside of a cigarette box. I hope you will forgive me, for I am still with you every day and every night to protect you. The family should respect themselves, do not give up on themselves, and I pray again to take care of their health. But it wasn't the brother's physical well-being that suffered. The father's death took a toll on their mental health which they didn't speak about for decades. The KMT imposed martial law in 1949, and any mention of the Tutuay incident could get people thrown in jail. Pan Xingxing didn't realize they weren't the only family to suffer such a loss until 40 years later, when martial law was lifted. I thought that For Taiwan's younger generations, 228 is a distant event they learn about in history books. But for numerous families like Pan's, who were forced to repress their experiences for decades, the so-called incident has left lasting repercussions. As Naya Zhou and Bing Wang for Taiwan Plus. That was Bing Wang reporting. How does Taiwan's journey compare to that of other countries that have suffered the legacy of large-scale human rights abuses? I speak with a former member of Taiwan's Transitional Justice Commission about what she learned from meeting with counterparts in Germany. What I can observe is that they really succeeded in um, in putting agenda into their national uh, education system. Uh, for example, in Germany, during their junior high program, um, every year they need to visit the former concentration camp site and also learn all the history around the Holocaust and also need to reflect on what the Nazi government did. Uh, how can a government uh, and the whole population participated in a, a mass um, human rights violation. And I think that kind of reflection uh, continue um, uh, helping the population to, uh, to, to build a real uh, democratic system, to defend that system and defend the core value of our democracy. And I think um, in Taiwan, due to different political reasons, uh, for example, uh, I think the main uh, crisis that we we are facing is that uh, the the KMT uh, still um, is still quite influential in our political scene. So um, 
it's really hard to persuade people that the community should play a role. Uh, uh, they also need to participate in the PJ program. So we can together to build uh, a more sound democracy. Has there been no participation from the KMT? I'm really, I'm really sorry to say that uh, as for now, um, although inside KMT there's several individual uh, deputies, they show interest in the TJ program and also uh, wanted to di discuss with them, but uh, that's not a consensus inside uh, KMT. But we can see Zhang Wang and uh, the, the mayor Zhang has just been elected to, to be uh, the mayor of our capital. And the first thing they do is to uh, reestablish the inscription of the Zhang Kai-shek statues. And I think that um, give a very negative message to our population that as if the dictator should be venerated uh, in a democratic era, politicians need to show more uh, regrets and show more sincerity uh, uh, to, to persuade the population that they are really willing to face the historical uh, era. Taiwan's Transitional Justice Commission completed its work in 2022 to set out the roadmap for the nation's path to healing. It lays out a program across ministries to try to ensure accountability, serve justice and enable reconciliation, thereby achieving transitional justice. Some of the mechanisms include prosecuting perpetrators, making reparations to victims' families, removing the hundreds of Chiang Kai-shek statues and reforming national history education. Professor Cho, mm -hmm. if I can come to you first. Um, let, I want to talk about the relationship between democracy and um, you know, the, the white terror mm -hmm. uh, and also reconciliation. Taiwan is now a vibrant democracy um, what role do you believe 228 and the White Tower played in Taiwan's very successful de democratization? Okay, first of all, uh, you know, uh, in the footage, you just saw that the uh, mayor, Jiang Wang'an, uh, he himself is a descent of the murderer, if you will. I mean, his great grandfather uh, was uh, Jiang Kai-she and grandfather was Jiang Jingguo. Uh, this type of politician, if they still want to jump into the arena of the politics, they should be very cautious. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that uh, they should be prohibited from uh, joining any form of politics. Mm -hmm. But if they don't do that, they better be prepared for what they are going to face, especially mm -hmm. when uh, if this politician, the mayor, has the ambition for a higher position in the future, uh, eventually this is going to be like a, 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 um, a, a, a crime. Maybe he himself did not commit, but his ancestor did. So he is a representative of the family. And also, not to mention that some sort of privilege he enjoyed in the past. Mm. So personally, I think that Jiang Wang'an's uh, electoral success this time in the 2022 election uh, more or less show that there is a compromise from mm. our society or, uh, or, or some sort of a, a, a reconciliation, if you will, from society. But mm. still, uh, in, in terms of your question, I think the democracy, uh, you know, m many instances like this, uh, this is actually occurring not only in Taiwan, but also in other countries, for, ex for example, in South Africa, and even in some uh, Eastern European countries. And uh, as I surveyed, I think there are at least 50 uh, truth commissions uh, so far around the globe. Mm. And, and different country has a different way of dealing with it. Mm. But as, as the researchers mentioned in the footage that Germany has done a in a pretty awesome job in, mm. in uh, recovering the truth or everything. So yeah. I and, think and Taiwan should do that as well. Mm. And actually Germany, very interesting, um, maybe I can move to Tonglen now, uh, Germany's uh, crimes against humanity, you can say actually occurred around about the same time as, uh, oh, no, uh, in during Second World War, and then we were talking about just slightly after Second World War. Um, Tonglen, we, we spoke, President spoke especially about how democratization has allowed us to have the conversations, but you know, is there a process that we would normally follow, that nations would normally follow for transitional justice? Is usually it's to help that transition into democratization. Whereas in fact, Taiwan achieved this without transitional justice. We, we can barely say that our transitional justice process has, has actually started, you know? But if you don't have a transitional justice and go through a democracy uh, and skipping that process, mm. you don't have a genuine democracy in right. a sense. Mm. Um, 
I like to bring back with uh, the case of Jiang Wanlan. Okay. I think uh, he had uh, seemed to suggest uh, we should change the name of Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall during his campaign. That was being criticized by the deep blue uh, inside the KMT. Mm -hmm. My worry nowadays is not about the majority Taiwanese, uh, about their thinking about transition justice. What I'm caring more is about the minority of mainland, what they are thinking. Now the new twist is that so, so you mean the mainlanders that live in Taiwan? Right. So, so Chinese living in Taiwan? In Taiwan, because now uh, would Taiwan become a democracy, uh, people are counting votes. Since you are a minority, they are worried that eventually they are somehow being, uh, uh, being, will be prejudiced against or being suffered, their, their, their children or their grandchildren will be discriminated against. And that kind of uh, worry or concern will be poison the politics of Taiwan. I think now KMT is being captured by a minority of deep blue these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if uh, KMT would ever uh, would try to win uh, a ruling party again, they should uh, be focusing not on those uh, minority of people, uh, they are having a more extreme view uh, than the majority. They should focus on the majority view. Mm. And I think uh, in the case of Jiang Wanlan, if he want to continue on his second term as mayor of Taipei, or even he want to aim for a higher position, he should, uh, he should gladly accept the responsibility as a great, great uh, children of mm. Chiang Kai-shek. And then, um, and then, see it fairly what his uh, grandfather or grand-grandfather had committed mm. and, and, and go along with the transition of justice mm. as they should, he should be, right? Pr President, there with a few ideas there that um, Song Lun mentioned. Mm -hmm. Can we pick up on this accepting responsibility? Mm -hmm. Is it true, do you think, that because Taiwan democratized and quite successfully, but not to become a real democracy, as Song Lun said and also the professor, um, has it meant that in fact, the perpetrators, even the KMT party, the Jiang family, they haven't actually fully accepted responsibility. They're allowed to do that because of the democracy, because of the economic growth. Yeah, I think the uh, uh, not fully accepting responsibility is not just about the elites within the KMT or, some, or uh, in some elites within the KMT, but uh, lacking such a gesture also indicate to the uh, society that uh, they refused. Uh, uh, to accept the interpretation that uh, Jiang Gai She or the Jiang Jingguo uh, for, uh, about what they did and that they should not be responsible for the favorable 228s, the white terror, and also the suppression, uh, institutional suppression against Taiwanese and, and others. Uh, so that the, um, uh, sometimes the leadership, uh, the showing the willingness to accept even a, a symbolic uh, gesture of the uh, willing to accept the uh, responsibility uh, is a very important um, uh, indicators and also it will show to the uh, the wider society especially uh, for the people who are uh, uh, dead against uh, accepting uh, those interpretations mm -hmm. as an indication that uh, we have to move on mm -hmm. and, um, and also uh, I will be able to take care of you and um, uh, I can I can win the things uh, even though that uh, some of your uh, con uh, concern uh, will be there, but uh, no, we can move on and uh, without any being prejudiced against. So I think the uh, um, sometimes uh, in order to avoid uh, so, sorry, the continuations. Sorry, sorry, President. So I just want to pick up on what you said. You said um, were you actually talking of a, a kind of amnesty for for, for perpetrators? No, I'm not no. talking about amnesty, but uh, the. Um, Willingness and of those leadership are uh, willing to uh, come out and uh, say that we accept the responsibility. And for example, in Jiang Wan, mm -hmm. uh, talks about that the uh, uh, the kind of the action that uh, his grandfather caused a great harm to the local Taiwanese, uh, and uh, how the, he feel that the, they should be uh, he or, or they should be responsible uh, for whatever happens. I think that will send out a very strong signals. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, uh, although the uh, uh, there are some quarter within KMT, probably they would be dead against uh, such actions, mm. 
but uh, it is important that uh, uh, for sending out the signal, uh, we also signal to um, people that uh, this uh, will be the uh, uh, interpretation that uh, we have to embrace. Uh, and uh, to move on from this uh, the stage to the next, uh, and uh, to end uh, the kind of the dichotomy that uh, we are having uh, from now, from now and forever. Mm, yes, this, the dichotomy between, as you said, mainlanders versus locals. Albert Cho, mm. um, before, obviously, the um, Transitional Justice Commission finished its work in May last year, 2022, um, this seems uh, you know, relatively late, given that we're talking about, you know, 228, 76 years ago. Why has there been such a delay? I, I think, um, you know, in Taiwan, there is a very uh, intriguing uh, phenomenon to me. That is, uh, sometimes we don't learn stuff uh, quickly enough just because there's no uh, external stimulus, right? And for me, uh, the, one of the major reasons why KMT, many politicians started to confront, I mean, start to face uh, the examinations from the society regarding 2-2-A uh, instance is that because they continue to lose elections. And even though that, uh, as the two uh, experts just mentioned, that a younger generation did not really take into consideration the dichotomy or typology between Melanders or Taiwanese that much, but still, uh, this whole argument, uh, you know, directly or indirectly to related to the uh, 2 to 8 instance has been inherent in our political system. And that actually plays a role in different kind of scenarios. So that is why I think that uh, KMT, especially uh, by the late administration uh, when Ma ying was still in power, he started to, to view this as a serious issue and started to, to uh, tackle that. Uh, not to mention that when Tsai Ing-wen took, uh, took the office and she set up the commission, unfortunately, uh, that was uh, some kind of uh, uh, mishandling of, of the information in the commission, and that's why uh, the, the whole commission has been uh, downgraded to a, a different unit. So but so still, there's a long way to go. What, yeah. what sort of mishandling? Uh, well, that, that was information about uh, you know the, the privacy of, of the uh, persons or people uh, involved in, in the white terror uh, uh, they are uh, from DPP or from KMT together. So, so that's that's actual wrongdoing, and, and that actually uh, kind of kind of uh, determine uh, uh, ki kind of serve as obstacle for for the investigation mm -hmm. and uh, invite a lot of criticism from the external society. Mm -hmm. But still, I think that the side uh, topic out there shouldn't uh, deter uh, the. Uh, deter the whole investigation from a further uh, clarity. Mm. Okay. I want to add something. Um, in the interview, uh, the lady just mentioned that um, she's hoping that KMT can join uh, the Transitional uh, Justice Committee. But uh, I think this is uh, what, from a KMT point of view, it's a political issue. Uh, they are thinking that by setting up this committee, it was used as an instrument uh, to, uh, to turn against KMT, to uh, confiscate all their party property, they're going to do damage to their reputation, and so on and so forth. So it cannot win a legitimacy in what they do. Mm. So this is the, the issue that we have been uh, facing these mm. days, that if there's no bipartisan support, if there, there's no legitimacy mm. in what the Transitional uh, Justice Committee is doing, then it will be hard for us to uh, reach a consensus. Mm. I mean, I mean, this is yeah a very difficult issue, isn't it? How how can it be a fair process? I mean, what what Albert said about you know the disbanding of that of that unit was obviously being used, uh, weaponized almost. Um, President Lai, when you look to other countries, you know how have they dealt with with this issue? I mean, it must be something that has has been suffered before in, in other parts of the world. I think that basically is that the uh, uh, our democratization process is, is like a piecemeal uh, transformation uh, from dictatorship on to the democracy, and uh, in the process, is there, especially in the piecemeal kind of the uh, the, uh, the procedures, we actually give up a lot of things. Uh, one of them definitely is the interpretation as well as how the uh, how the past event should be viewed, and uh, also led led to KMT as that uh, those issues are. Uh, uh, they have been brought today because the KMT is losing the support in the democracy. So basically, for them, it's a political battle. 
uh, and they view it continually and as a political battle until today. So that is the, uh, in my view, that's a very uh, big hindrance about how we can actually reach uh, the kind of understanding. Um, I, in the KMT, if you look at the whole uh, attitude, Li Denghui, while he was a KMT chairman, he came out to apologize mm -hmm. uh, uh, about the, what, what, what was there. Mm -hmm. But Li, Li Denghui later on has been kicked out of the KMT. Yeah. And uh, he is no longer uh, uh, revered uh, within the KMT, mm -hmm. and uh, so so is his interpretation about history about what what was mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. Although mind Zhou, uh, to a certain extent, still attends a two to a ceremony every and um, every year, but the issue, especially for the uh, victim, is that uh, continuously uh, they they his way of the saying in February two they came from uh, the differences of the culture between Taiwan and China. That to them, that's a completely uh, uh, wrong in terms of how they feel at that time. Uh, they believe that this is a direct state uh, suppression uh, and it came from a colonial government uh, rather than a bit of differences bet bet uh, because of the culture, because a long, uh, long time now the, uh, the isolation between Taiwan and, and China. Uh, so that the way that they had been interpreted uh, by mind you, uh, to a certain extent also add up uh, the uh, kind of hostility among the uh, K, uh, February 228 uh, uh, the uh, victims and the family, and also uh, the white society were large uh, regarding the, the KMT is thinking about. So I think that right now, the uh, Jiang Wanan, uh, to a certain extent, he has the advantage. First of all, he is a descent of the Jiang's family. And second, he won the uh, city mayorship, not because of the, uh, his name of Jiang, although that also, uh, basically gave him the nod within the KMT. But he was able to win uh, in a type of city mayor election because of who he is, because of what he's done also uh, to some people, because he's good looking and uh, he's young mm -hmm. and energetic. Uh, so that uh, Jiang Wan, in comparison with other KMT older generations, uh, he has the advantage and uh, he should be able uh, to have a free reign about uh, what he thinks it is. Although uh, there are still the, the deep, uh, uh, the uh, the so-called deep blue or the some of the uh, hardline the KMT supporters they are set uh, deadly against uh, such interpretation. Mm. But sometimes the leadership, uh, if you're willing to step out, uh, your support will be more than the KMT. Mm. Tonglun has spoken about how you know the KMT is worried about not getting a fair trial. Let's call, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. um, are these just excuses? Um, I, I think that, first of all, to me, uh, you know, from my educational background and how much I have learned from since I was a child to, to now, uh, I, I think Jiang kai Shek should be the one who is in, in charge, totally. Mm. I mean, that mm. goes 100%. And, uh, so, so he's, yeah, he's now mean, passed away. He, so, he's, so he's what the happens one who did, not, who did not command the troops to kill mm. people, mm. Uh, Chen Yi Wo. Chen Yi was the executive chief. Mm. Uh, but. Uh, you know, Zhang Kai-shek uh, 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 is one of the uh, uh, person in that position, and mm. he was losing the battlegrounds to the uh, Communist Party in the mm. civil war. So he he did not really uh, emphasize Taiwan as much as he should have done. Mm. So so that instance was really as a consequence of uh, the ignorance and also the dismiss of the Kuomintang authority at that time of Taiwan. So that's that's my my you know. Y I, people could have different interpretation of this, mm. but to me, it, it's that's his problem. Okay, mm. but the second step is that uh, okay. So what to do about it? Mm. Uh, should we dismantle the uh, Chiang Kai Shek study, uh, which I agree, but uh, to what uh, form? Because even in Germany, you have this uh, Nazi sites, uh, you know, remains there for educational purpose. Mm. Should we, uh, you know, change the Chiang Kai Shek Memorial Hall to s some kind of educational museum or something, mm. or should we just remove that completely? Mm. Uh, it's subject to the public discussion. Mm. So let's talk about what um, initiatives Taiwan has already started or taken taken out, you know, independently of this transitional justice roadmap. Tonglong, do you want to talk about, um, you know, there's obviously there's Peace Memorial Day, there's a, a public holiday so that people can reflect um, on the events. Uh, I think that um, having this February 28th uh, as a, uh, Peace Memorial Day is just like uh, what in the States is having Martin Luther Day on uh, January 15th. It's a day that uh, for the people in Taiwan can have a reflection on what uh, Taiwan had achieved and what kind of uh, lesson it can learn uh, from the tragedy. 
And I think that uh, this uh, Transitional uh, Justice Committee, I think it should continue. I mean, even uh, if one day KMT become the ruling party, they should continue uh, the Transitional Justice mm -hmm. Committee. And in order to let it function as a bipartisan institutions mm -hmm. and let the history uh, will reveal itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if um, uh, it can continue on that path, and especially I was thinking that uh, maybe uh, by having a bipartisan effort, we can come up with a new identity. What I mentioned is uh, on 2019, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen had uh, coined a phrase, it's called Republic of China, Taiwan. This phrase is something new that we never heard of. And I think uh, she is having a grand uh, attempt of having a new identity. And the starting date of this Republic of China, Taiwan is from 1949. It's not starting from 1911. It's not starting from 1945. It's starting when all the people from China is coming settled in Taiwan, and then uh, people is living with Taiwanese side by side. And that had created a new identity, a new community. I think that is uh, a, a, a new consensus maybe we can build on. Mm, okay, um, and finally, President, uh, you know, what do you think of Tong Lung's idea of a bipartisan uh, committee, justice committee, you know, in highly divided Taiwan? Is it possible to get transitional justice? Um, I just hope that it, will, it could work because right now a lot of things that when we talk about the bipartisan, basically it becomes a political battle between those parties. Uh, each party has its representative there and they are guarding their party's interest uh, so that uh, just like uh, uh, the Italian Foundation for Democracy as well as others, the, um, uh, that's how it works in Taiwan. So probably we do not have other venues. Mm. But I would say that the- uh, Could, could uh, we bring the UN in? An international body, uh, but, the but Taiwan, we're not, we're not but, members of well, the UN. No, well, yeah, the UN <laughs> has to accept Taiwan as a, its member first, uh, so that we could uh, could do that. But mm. I think, uh, no, no, it, in, in, instead of having uh, rely on others, what we should do it ourselves. Mm. This is our own issue, and we have to grapple with this. I'd like to thank President Lai Dong, Tong Lung Guo, and Albert Cho for joining us on Taiwan Talks today. Hello, I'm Ian Kavat of Taiwan Talks. We just discussed the 228 incident, one of the darkest moments in Taiwan's modern history, a brutal crackdown that triggered decades of martial law and an era known as the White Terror. What we want to know from you is, can Taiwan possibly achieve its transitional justice in its politically divided society? Let us know below in the YouTube comments. Also, if you like our shows, please hit subscribe. Thank you for watching today. Stay safe and see you next time.